China, the world's greatest superpower, where old meets young, rich meets poor, cuisine that astonishes the world and a government that is in touch with its people. Hello, my name is Professor I. M. Unbaised. I began my academic career in Oxford, England, where I studied journalism at undergraduate level. I eventually worked my way up to lecturer, and around about that time I decided that the practices of the British press weren't really to my liking. There was far too much government restrictions and, and legislation on freedom of the press. Um, so as a result, I moved to China, where I now lecture at Peking University in Beijing. And uh, the press here enjoy a much more liberal and free, open policy towards um, journalism and also what the state media can cover. Um, some people say it's biased. Um, I myself would completely disagree. That's completely unfounded. Um, whilst here, I, I developed an interest in Far East conflict, uh, primarily between China and Japan, and uh, I'd love to tell you more about it. So here we see a map of the Far East. Here is China, to the north of it is Mongolia, and to the east of it is Japan. So I will now highlight the location of the Great Wall of China. Now I shall go into detail a little bit later on as to its significance in the Far Eastern conflict. The conflict between Japan and China has its roots well within World War II. The Empire of Japan planned to invade China. I will now draw arrows which indicate Japan's plans of attack. As you may or may not notice, there are no arrows going from China to Japan. Instead, Japan's ultimate goal was to obliterate the mainland of China and kill all the pandas. The Japanese military forces don't really compare that greatly to the Chinese forces. Um, for instance, the soldiers. Uh, Japanese soldiers are often very short, uh, stand completely still in public for some reason. Their helmets are often made of tin foil. Um, not the best protection uh, in the world, but there we go. If, if your government's having major spending cuts, then uh, you have to recoup some investment somewhere. Um, Chinese soldiers, on the other hand, are the apex military might. They're, they are numerous in number, um, uncounted amount of soldiers. It is said if you line them up one behind the other, they could stretch to the moon and back again. There, there's so many of them. Despite this, they're very, very well organised. You can often see them walking around Beijing streets in ranks of three or four, and uh, patrolling the diplomatic areas, keeping all of the foreign ambassadors safe and generally protecting the city's citizens. Um, they're held in high regard throughout Chinese history. The soldier has always been a, a uh, talisman of, of political and military might and uh, that continues on today. So in this clip you can see a, Jap a standard Japanese tank. Um, Often they are garbage lorries taken from the civilian sector and elevated to military um, tanks. This is because the Japanese military defence budget is around about 50p. Now what is special about these Japanese tanks? Well, they've got a turning circle of about 8 kilometres. Uh, their max speed is about 5 miles per hour. The driver is completely exposed, no armament on the vehicle at all. One special thing the Japanese have developed special armour. Now these black bins you can see on the back contain thousands upon thousands of propaganda leaflets. Therefore if this, if this vehicle is blown up the, the leaflets are dispersed throughout the immediate area. On the other hand the Chinese tanks are full metal construction uh, run on biodiesel. They've won an award recently, a platinum award for um, environmental uh, awareness. Uh, the driver and the gunner are completely encased in metal, there's nothing going to get through that. It's around about 100mm thick. Top speed of 20 miles per hour and a turn in circle, it can turn on a 5p piece. So a lot has been said in uh, recent years on the international stage about China's rising pollution levels, um, especially within the city of Beijing. 
it may seem to a lot of people that China's recent industrialization uh, is a reason or a cause for this uh, for this fact. I can tell you that that is fundamentally not true. Um, I myself have undergone studies uh, looking into the China Daily uh, Archives, also the Peking University Archives as well, and I can tell you that um, it's a little known truth. This smog is actually artificially um, generated in Tokyo <coughs> and um, blown over through purpose-made windmills uh, specifically to sit above the city of Beijing. Now, a lot of people would look at the Beijing skyline and instantly it hits them how many high-rise skyscrapers and buildings there are. Um, this is because China has tried to develop a city that can reach high enough to get out of the smog and out of this um, sort of artificial Japanese uh, pollution tactic that's been employed. During my uh, studies, it came to my attention that uh, within Chinese history there was actually uh, a great amount of neutrality and also um, abstination from violence. Um, when Mongolia attempted to attack China, China did not retaliate at all. Instead they erected a humongous wall in order to keep the Mongolians out. There is an old Chinese proverb that kept cropping up throughout my studies uh, and it states that a wall cannot move in a cannot strike. Instead you can strike it and injure yourself. Uh, this is especially relevant to the Mongolian uh, and Chinese conflicts. Um, basically what happened was that the Mongolians wished to invade China. Uh, in light of this China erected a massive wall in front of them and the Mongolians and the Chinese suffered no losses on either side. Uh, this is a somewhat neutral standpoint, if an extreme extreme case of it, but um, it's also said that the construction of the Great Wall, as fast as it was, infringed human rights, and I'd like to state this, that it didn't infringe human rights, uh, because at the time of its construction, human rights didn't exist, so as far as I'm concerned, completely humane construction. Um, the Great Wall serves as a great example of China's future policy surrounding far e or potential Far Eastern conflicts involving Japan. Um, it is proposed in the Chinese government recently uh, a plan to brick up Japan's coastlines and its shipping lanes, if not to protect it from outside forces, uh, instead to protect it from itself. Well, thank you very much for hearing me speak today. Um, I would like, just like to draw your attention to these primary texts here, all published in uh, Beijing around about the late 1960s, um, backed, of course, by scientific facts. So here we go. Um, we have Strategy, 1 against 10, Tactics, 10 against 1, by Li So Peng, a well-known established communist figure. We have Karl Marx, Wages, Price and Profit. We have Vladimir Lenin, The State. We have Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, Manifesto of the Communist Party. We have a small book here, Little Soldier Chang Kei Tse, a well-known communist superhero. We have this little red book by Mao Zedong. Uh, we have Mao Zedong on practice, paperback edition. We have Mao Zedong on practice, hardback edition. We have Mao Zedong, to be attacked by the enemy is not a bad thing, but a good thing. We have Mao Zedong, the foolish old man who removed the mountains. We have Mao Zedong, serve the people. And last but not least, my personal favourite, Mao Zedong on the correct handling of contradictions among the people. A real good read, I, I, I thoroughly recommend it.